there are teachers and there are teachers, and there are subjects and there are subjects. And when you're dealing with a prophetic subject, it becomes more important. Uh, we, we say there are two classes of information, and one is historic, and the other is pertinent. That anything that doesn't relate to your future could be classed as something historical. Uh, the story of Jonah is a good historical subject. It has nothing to do with your spiritual life today. But the blood of Jesus Christ has everything to do with your spiritual life today. And, and so it's very important to classify the, the type of material that we're receiving into our inner persons. And we are dealing with tomorrow and the gifts of the Spirit because the circle that goes around uh, is about to be closed and we are about to receive the same type of thing that happened in Jerusalem and in the early church in the first hundred years. And, and in some parts of the world, they are already moving in the gifts of the Spirit very, very strong. And we, we feel that God can't do much for ignorant people, you know, because they would do it wrong anyway. And so we must learn. It's not bad to be ignorant. It's bad to stay ignorant. Uh, we're all ignorant until we learn something. Uh, and, and so th that part of it's not bad, but to say that way is bad. What we want to do is to learn and learn in such a way that it becomes part of our insides, you know, uh, until when we open our mouth, the right thing comes out. We have learned it so perfectly. And that's what we feel about the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're dealing with page 10 in your teaching uh, syllabus. And so if you would uh, turn over that way, we feel at it, this juncture, before we get into identifying the operation of the gifts of the Spirit, uh, that it would be very necessary to let you know what the word uh, charisma actually means, and that the t total of the gifts of the Spirit are in that realm. And if they're in that realm, then we should be acquainted with the realm as to how it functions and, you know, the total truth about it. So it says the Christian world is excited about charisma. I don't think in any uh, point of history that I know about that the whole world has become excited about one thing as they have about this, this charisma. Uh, for example, in the Philippines, there was a time, I don't know how it would be just this moment, but there was a time when they said they had as many charismatic Catholics as they had old-fashioned Catholics, as, uh, the regular Catholics. Uh, it meant that the charisma had made such an inroad into that denomination until it had a, a strength a strength there. And, and so uh, all over the face of this earth, in Ethiopia, and the church that I preach in when I'm there is a Lutheran church, but it is charismatic Lutheran. The people all have the Holy Ghost and they shout and praise God and rejoice in God. And, and so it's a different type of, of, a, of a Lutheran church. And so what I mean here is that the Christian world is excited about the word charisma. And, and when I say Christian world, I mean the total Christian world is, is excited about that word. Now, many of them may not know the true uh, effects of it. Effects is better than meaning of it. Uh, they may not know what will happen to you if you get into it. You see, uh, it, it could isolate you from some other people. It, it, could, uh, it, it could cause someone to criticize you uh, when you were not worthy of the criticism. But anyway, uh, we need to know the, the embodiment of what we're going to discuss together, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the key word there is the word charisma. Uh, charismatic meetings are the end thing worldwide. <laughs> Whether you like that or not, uh, that is the truth. The, the, those, those people, or these people, are winning more souls to Jesus than anybody else on the face of the earth. And the people that wish to ignore them one time can't ignore them when the largest church in, in, in South Africa is one of these churches, a charismatic church, when the largest church in Sweden is this, this kind of a church, and, and the largest church in Portugal is this kind of a church, uh, then everybody begins to say, hey, 
What you going to do? Thousands of people have received this charismatic blessing. And, and so it has come to the attention of anybody that thinks religious, they also think charismatic. And they make a decision. And, and uh, some make a negative decision, some make a positive decision. Uh, that's all right. They did that in Jesus' day. Some were very negative. They said, kill him. That's a little negative, I'd say. Uh, and, and so uh, Martin Luther went through the same thing. He lost most of his friends by becoming what we call charismatic. And uh, he, he never thought that he'd be creating a church called Luther after his own name at all. That's what they did after he was gone. But he thought of giving people the living Savior, that the just shall live by faith and not by crawling around on the floor, that you shall live by the faith of God within you. And he spent his whole life talking about justification. And, and so uh, uh, down through the years, we've had people that had touches of this and inevitably it separated them from some people called friends. And uh, you, that's a little price you have to pay. Uh, but uh, it is the end thing worldwide today and the whole world has come to its attention. If they ever start counting the people in Russia that, that are Christian religious, you're going to come out of there saying, well, my God, we didn't realize that maybe 75% of all spiritual phenomena in the country is what you call charismatic. They, they are the people that are moving through that nation and building, building congregations of thousands of people. And, and so uh, uh, it is the end thing to talk about. I won't say receive. Uh, there's some that have already said, no, I don't want it. And when you say that, then you close your own door. God didn't do it. You close your own door to the, to the miracles of God, uh, to, the, to the anointings that God has for us, and to the great truths regarding the gifts of the Spirit. In 1 Peter 4 and 10, really it's one of my, my, my little pet ones, you know, that I like very much. Every preacher has little verses he likes more than he, he does others. And this is one I like. As every man hath received the gift, let him minister the same. Now, now that would knock most churches to pieces, you know. Uh, they, uh, they, they don't mind receiving gifts. They just don't want to give it to anybody else. Uh, they say, I'm timid. You're not timid at the ball game. I saw you. And, and so why should we be timid with God when we're not timid with other things? That means the devil has lied to us. That we're actually not. That the devil has gotten a victory there that we should not permit him to have. Anyway, we feel that if you've got something, when Paul says, I am a debtor, this, this is what he was talking about, you know. He says, I'm a debtor to the Greeks, the intellectuals. I'm a debtor to the Jews, the religious people. I'm a debtor to the barbarians, the very ignorant people. It didn't matter who they were. He was a debtor. And his debt is in this verse here, that what you have received, you have an obligation to give it. Man, if we did that, we'd save this world in a hurry, wouldn't we? If every one of us began to tell what God has done for us and we told, told it real loud and firm, we'd have a different world on us real quick. And I think God wants us to. And all the people said, in 2 Corinthians and, and chapter 3 and verse 6, it says, our sufficiency is from God. Uh, all, all Christians need to, to get to that basic truth that uh, really what we have uh, in fullness, we got it from God. If we were a minister, he gave us the abilities. We didn't just develop it. If we're a lay person, whoever we are, our sufficiency didn't come from man. It didn't come from intellectualism. It didn't come from humanism for sure. So our sufficiency, I like the word fulfillment. Our total fulfillment comes from God. I'm a fulfilled person, <laughs> whether I look like it or not. I'm a fulfilled person. I, uh, if you give me anything, anything spiritual, it's a runover case. It runs over because I'm already full. If I get something more, then I'm uh, over full. And uh, when you get over full, you run over full, you know. And, and, and so uh, how wonderful it is that our sufficiency is not in a denomination. It's not in a doctrine. Uh, our sufficiency is in Christ. And if we'll get our sufficiency in the right place, I want to tell you something. It'll give you total fulfillment in this life. You won't be begging for something. You'll have it. 
we'll have it. And all the people said, our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as the ministers of the new covenant. We don't have anything to be ashamed of. Uh, our new covenant is the greatest covenant on the face of this earth. It's been so interesting to me that I have looked with my own eyes and heard with my own ears every religion on the face of the earth. I've seen them in action. I've walked into the, what they call their sanctuaries. And when I have seen all the religions in the world, man, do I ever thank God for Christianity. Are you here? And if you don't mind, the Protestant branch. We don't have to have statues around that we go by and kiss their dead nails and, and toenails and all. We, we, don't, we don't have to do that. That our relationship is a dynamic one from our insides. Glory to God! That we have a living thing within us that transforms us and makes us. And our sufficiency is from God and that we are sufficient. You know, we're full. We are sufficient as ministers of this new covenant, uh, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Well, that'll get you on it. Yeah, not of the letter. Anybody can teach dogmas. Anybody can say, you're wrong. The Word says this. How about your living? How about your living? You know, some of the most religious people I've ever seen were about the nastiest people in the world. And when I see them, I says, well, no doubt, no, no doubt in my mind why, why, why Jesus lived with the sinners. He couldn't stand that bunch of righteous people. <laughs> we're not only supposed to be righteous, we're supposed to be agreeable too and not be so hard to get along with. And, and sometimes it's our righteousness that makes us so bad. You ain't like me and you ain't good. Well, they may be better than you. You better, but anyway. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. The letter kills. If you're going to just go by, by the Ten Commandments, you know, right down there, it'll kill. But you go by the spirit that created them and you'll live. You see, you, you won't have to be told not to make other gods if you got Jesus in you. You already got it. Can you say amen? All right. But the spirit gives life. Now, what is this thing that we call charisma? I am sure a lot of people use it that have no identification with this background. Uh, <clears throat> the, the Greek word for charisma means a spiritual gift. It means something that has been freely given. In its characteristic usage, it denotes the extraordinary ability bestowed by the Holy Spirit for special services. Now, if that line could get in, inside of all of us who love that word, and it is a very beautiful word, it, it, that, that the, the word charisma not only has to do with receiving, it has to do with giving. Are you here? Amen. In fact, I, I don't know that you can keep the charisma that God wants you to have if you're not willing to share what he's given us. That the, <clears throat> the secret of maintaining it is that we give it that we share it. I have a feeling inside of me that maybe 99% of all Christians just don't get out there and share. They're ashamed to, or they think they're busy, or, or so forth. But I can tell you one thing, in seeing revival all over the face of the earth, I have never seen a great revival that it was not the people that were giving it out and not the pulpit. We all want the pulpit to do it. And there's never been a revival that wasn't in the people's hearts. Until it gets into the people's hearts, it won't ever grow. It's got to get into the people's hearts. The laity, they've got to come acquainted with that thing, you know. And, and they've got to tell others. If they don't tell others, then it'll never be told. I heard Billy Graham say one time that about 80% of all the visitors to all of his great crusades, they came because somebody personally invited them. Not because they put ads on television or ads on the radio or send out letters and so forth. That the great majority of the people that came as visitors and got saved in his meetings were brought there by someone that cared. And, and uh, that, that's true of all of Christianity. It's, it's true of our church, other churches, any church. It's true of, true of revival crusades that we are the ones, we're the key to this thing. And, and uh, we, we ought to thank God for it. It, it don't go with, without us, you know. 
You remember the story of the little lady I told you in one of my re recent talks that uh, I thought I'd done a good job in this town. The whole town was stirred. And I was feeling real good about it as an evangelist until a little woman told me she had fasted for 10 days and nights. And God told us, now I'm going to give the revival. And she got out there just when the revival broke. And when it broke so big that nobody could handle the thing all over the place, then she came up and said, you know why we got a revival? And I was about to tell her, sure do. But she got hers in first. She said, I fasted the first 10 days and nights you were here for God to break the power of the devil over this city and said, he told me that I could go to church that night and see it. And she got there in time to see it. Sometimes it's a little person in the background that brings the results. And that person could be you. And all the people said, <clears throat> by the Holy Spirit for special service. And that is the reason we call these gifts. And, and uh, I call them the weapons of our warfare. I, I turn them around from a luxury situation. You know, we all love luxury items. You don't have what I got. I speak in tongues and you don't. You got more than you got. And we look at it as a luxury item, you know, but God doesn't. He looks upon them as the weapons that we fight the devil with. If you've got anything from God, the purpose of it is, is defeating the devil and bringing victory to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if we can... If we, if we can take all the gifts of God and make them into weapons of defeating the devil, then that's what the Lord would have us to do. And that the gifts of the Spirit. If we had the total gifts of the Spirit in operation in this country, it would change this nation. That's all it would take. If we had the gift of the word of wisdom and we could tell governors and mayors and presidents what was going to happen tomorrow and next week and next month, if somebody that had the gift of, 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 of the gift of, of, of revelation and the word of wisdom and could have said, Mr. Bush, go ahead and, and, and fight that punk over there called Hussein. Says, you won't lose a hundred men in the whole deal. If you could have said that 10 days before, you'd have been important by now. Do you know that? You say, why isn't the church important? Because it's not doing what the church is supposed to do. We're supposed to have the gifts of the spirit functioning in us just like it did in Elisha. Elisha was guiding the whole nation through the king by the gifts of the Spirit. And, and, and that can happen. God hadn't changed any. All the people said. All right. Uh, they're the weapons of our warfare. They are the gifts uh, given to the body, to the body of Christ, laity or, or clergy, uh, to the body of Christ to enable the church to defeat any enemy which comes against it. Now, there's your purpose of your charisma. It is not for you to play dolls with. It's not for you to carry around in your arms as a sweet little baby. It is a, a fighter. It is a destroyer. It is a builder. And, and, and these gifts will change people and they will change churches. They will change, change communities. They will change nations. They will change nations. The devil knows this. And, and you hear all the time, here's a miracle over here, and uh, here's an, uh, an idol, tears comes out of its eyes. And, and, and they're always trying to do in a counterfeit what God wants to do in a reality. They can't produce the reality, of course, and so they have to cheat in order to get something going. But we don't have to get into that type of world. We're in the world of truth. Say truth. And we, we deal with truth. We don't hide anything. And we're not trying to be something we are not. We just want to state the facts of the Word of God and make them work. And all the people said. I said, all right, now, now the plural word, that should be a new paragraph there. The, 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 the plural, the plural a Greek word, charismata, is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4, 9, 28, 30, and so forth. The special gifts of, the, of charisma are operations of supernatural revelation, the three, the three categories, we taught that already, uh, of, of revelation, where God reveals something, of power or energy, uh, that God does something, and inspiration, to where God causes the insides of a person to be lifted up. And that third grouping there is mostly for the church. For it to be in, in inspired by, to secure the church against the devil, these gifts are ours. The, uh, against the devil, also against the world. You get the gifts of the spirit working. You don't live so close to the world. 
You can't live both places at the same time. And you get the gifts of the Spirit working, or they'll cease to work. When you become worldly, they just drop out of the picture. And they are out of the picture in most churches. There won't be one church in a hundred in the whole of this nation today that has the function, the gifts of the Spirit, even beginning in them, like uh, lesser gifts, like tongues and interpretation. So we got a, lot, we got a lot of area out there to cover and got a lot of people to bless. That's the reason we're glad to be on television. We're glad that in Africa they, they listen to this, you see, uh, through our short wave. And all over the world they, they're getting to know this is the time to move for God. This is the time to put all of the, the great powers that, has, that are available to the church, put them in action and see a mighty revival take place. Can you say amen? amen? Now, there are countries that are so open to this. We returned from Russia, and whether it was a morning or an afternoon or an evening service, several thousand people came forward to get saved. You, 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 with your eyes, have never seen people so willing to get saved as those people. Uh, they, they, they have nothing. Communism died, died a natural death. Nobody had to kill it just died a natural death, and they don't, they don't have anything to follow right now. They don't have any government to follow. It's all to pieces. They don't have any economic system to follow. It's all to pieces. They don't have anything to follow, and they want Jesus. They want Jesus. And, and it's our privilege, our privilege. And to you that don't know it, not only did we, not only did we uh, uh, feed those people by the many, many tons and tons and tons, we left in the storage over there several million dollars worth of food and medical supplies. And that for this whole winter, we will be giving out food to those that are in great need. And if you're reading carefully what the news world is saying today, it's going to be a dark winter for Europe. A very dark one. We're going to put some brightness in it. Can you say amen? In Jesus' name. We're bringing that boat back across the ocean. We're going to refill it on the East Coast. We're going to take it into, into the countries in the south of Europe that are so devastated, like Albania and Yugoslavia, if we can. If they'll stop fighting, fighting long enough, let us get in and give them some to eat. And, and then in, in to Ethiopia. We, we mean to bless a world that's crying out. And we mean, if you were over there with us, you would have been disappointed, I imagine. It didn't seem like a feeding thing. We never even saw Russians rushing for food. We saw them rushing to Jesus. It was a soul-saving operation. And, and with those meetings every day and thousands of people getting saved, uh, it was really a change of Russia in their hearts. And it was all done during their crisis. Nobody stopped us. Nobody held us back. But hearts were open. And aren't you glad for it? And all the people said, all right, it says, and these gifts show an encounter, a personal encounter with God. Now, that's very interesting. It's not an encounter with the religion. It's not an encounter with your denomination. But the gifts of the Holy Spirit reveal an encounter, encounter with the Almighty God, that you've gotten something beyond the veil and pulled it out, that you've gotten something supernatural and got a hold of it, that it is not an intellectual thing, nor is it a natural thing. None of these gifts are in the world of the natural. You live in the natural, but these gifts are all in the supernatural. And when you move into the gifts of the Spirit, you move from the natural into the supernatural. And all the people said, so the gifts represent a co-action with the human personality that you, and whatever you are, and then a divine and supernatural power from God. So it's a combination of you and God together, working together. So it is a divine, human interworking. Now, a lot of people don't quite understand that. When you receive the gift of speaking in tongues, how many have received that gift? I see, right? <clears throat> you that haven't can receive even today. While we're, while we're in this meeting, you can receive today. But when you receive the gift to talk to God in a spiritual language, you can do it anytime. My spirit's in here. Nothing that I uttered here came from this area. It came from my spirit area. And God knows that. He put that language in there. And God knows that. Paul said, I speak in tongues more than a whole church full of you people. <laughs> Brother, he had it bad. 
How many would like to be like Paul? No, you wouldn't. He was a, he, he, he was a fanatic of the first order. Yeah, you could. Yeah, yeah. He turned cities upside down. You don't even want to turn a thimble up. And, and, and so uh, uh, he, he was a man full of these gifts. And, and if you study our syllabus, we show you the gifts that functioned in his ministry under, under him, the gifts of the Holy Ghost. And we want those gifts to function in the whole of our nation. You people at home, we want to pray a prayer over you that will cause these gifts to function right in your own home there. We want God to move in our nation. And this word charismatic and charisma, yeah, did you notice that even the magazines use it now? Yeah, well, they don't know what it is for sure. You know, they, they, they're just using a pretty word. They don't know what it is. They don't know that it is a co-meeting of man and God and relationship with the human and the supernatural. You see, they, they don't realize that, but you and I are in on it. Say, we're in on it. We're in. Yeah, we're in on it. Well, hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand, everybody. Well, I sure worked hard on that. I got the first page. How many got I got the first page? Oh, sometimes I don't get a whole page. I only get a part of the page. But anyway, we will begin just, just where we left off and go till we get through, however long that is. And we will learn, I trust, we will learn how to move in the power of the Holy Ghost and the power of God. And all the people said, Amen. 